Welcome to the Startup Grind. Okay, so I'm not Mike, so I'll hopefully I'll be loud enough for the people to back hear me. Good. That means you have to be loud, too. <laughs> I'm ready? Did, I'm did ready. You, you're ready? Yes. Okay, so usually you begin at the beginning? I do. Yes, that's what we do. That's... So where are you from? Uh, so I am from Huehuetenango, Guatemala, uh, which is a Central American country. I was born there, and uh, we moved to South Texas when I was two years old. Okay, so how did you make it from Guatemala to South Texas? Well, so my parents were huge into literacy. They were literacy advocates, and their life mission was to improve reading for everyone. So when civil, uh, my father's from Iowa, by the way. He's from the, uh, the Midwest. Um, he kind of, on his own journey, landed in Guatemala and thought my mom was cute. And uh, <laughs> he thought, he, we, well, we thought we were going to spend the rest of our lives there. But civil war broke. And so uh, it got a little tense, and my father thought, let's go back to my country, because your country is unstable. So we did that, and they picked Texas, South Texas especially, because they thought that their, their skills and their mission would be best served there. OK. OK, so when, when you start at a place like Startup Grind, and you talk about entrepreneurship, you always want to like talk right. about early influences. <clears throat> So, right. let's tell everybody about Bon Jovi Club. <laughs> Anybody in here been in Bon Jovi Club? No. Nope. Bon well, Jovi Club. You I'm, can't I'm, talk about it. I'm currently recruiting, so <laughs> anyone who wants to join the Bon Jovi Club is welcome. There's a, there's a cover charge, though. It's 50 cents. And, uh, but there's a pizza party afterwards. Um, yeah, Bon Jovi Club was, I, I think, my, my first entrepreneurial effort. I wanted to, I, I lived in South Texas, so trees were scarce, it was plains. And I wanted to create a clubhouse uh, for uh, friends to come in and uh, have social gatherings. Uh, so what, uh, however, I could not convince my father to provide free labor. Uh, Is that what he said? Did he say, I yeah. will not provide you free He's like, I'm not driving you to so, the hardware store, and I'm not going to put a nail in a hammer. He's and... an idealist with a profit motive. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> uh, so what I did convince him to drive me to the hardware store, and we figured out that I could use pegboard, and that's that board with holes in it, and then I could use some heavy-duty yarn, and that's how I, I think that was my first panel effort. <laughs> now that I'm thinking about it, yeah. And, and so I could, with yarn, put together panels and create a space. And so I did the floor, I did the ceiling, and I made two rooms out of it so that in case we wanted to have private conferences, you could kind of go behind one and, and how section. How old were you when you made your first yarn building? Uh, <laughs> I was in third grade. Okay. Um, and so I knew that I needed funding for it. And uh, in my neighborhood, there were 15 girls and 15 boys or, or less or more and you didn't uh, really care about that I didn't really I, I did well so all of the girls were my younger sister's age and they all had a crushes on the boys who were a little older than me so I thought let's uh, let's uh, create this Bon Jovi club and listen to rock and roll Bon Jovi everyone would love it I mean I had posters of Bon Jovi all over my bedroom and so I couldn't imagine someone who was not a Bon Jovi fan. And, uh, and, but beforehand, we would play this movie, and I would convince my father to make popcorn. And everyone would pay a dollar, and we would get pizza, and then it would just be this like amazing thing, and everyone would come and hang out in my clubhouse. <laughs> what did you do with the money you made from Bon Jovi Club? I hosted a party, and then we had extra money, and then I didn't know what to do with it, so afterwards, I kind of gave away little gifts. <laughs> <laughs> That's not normally how that works. But okay. No, it is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so you you started early with this idea of charging for something. Yes. And you weren't quite sure what to do with the profits. You eventually figured that out. Uh, yes, I will. I still have a ways to go. Uh, <laughs> my partner is yeah. <laughs> so okay, so you end up going to college at UT. Yes. And you study I, architecture. Okay. Um, and it's a bachelor of architecture degree, so it's a five-year program, ten studios. Uh, a studio is a, like a five-hour class that is actually like 40 hours a week. It's a full-time job. And we get through the entire design process. And what was interesting about that, though, is that every two weeks we would get judged on the process of our design. 
And so from a very early age, I was subject to a panel of jurors who had a lot to say about something I was barely getting to know. <laughs> so that was some grind right there. Also because in my third year, if you did not, uh, if, you, if you were in the bottom 20% of the performers in that class, you were asked to change your major. Wait, hold on, they ask you to leave the, the program? Yes. And they it's want to keep their averages up or something? I don't know. Well, I, so, in, so years later, like, when I go to business school years later, I think back and I, I think it was like, you know, the, the world doesn't, doesn't need that many architects. So they don't want to graduate so many, <laughs> because then it would not be a, a you know a supply demand match. But I didn't learn about supply demand until many years later, and we'll get to that. And, and how did you decide architecture was going to be your thing? I mean, this sounds like a grueling program. Yes, it is. Um, so on my mother's side, uh, there uh, uh, I have an uncle who's an architect, and he had this house that um, in the center, was, and it was in Guatemala, so think Hispanic with the, with the patio in the middle, with the garden, Arabic, Arabic garden, and all of that kind of stuff. So it was this like beautiful central courtyard inside of the garden, and there would be this light that would shine down on the drafting table that he would draw on every day. The thing, though, is that since there, are not, there is not much of a demand for an architect, he did architecture as a hobby, even though he was a licensed architect. He actually ran the family tile business. Um, so I, he would talk you know, in, in fantasy about it all the time, which I think as a child influenced me thinking it would be so amazing. And it was, I had a really nice architect, architecture career. Well, okay, so you, you finished, you survived the architecture program at UT. Right. And then you decided to stay in Texas. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so where do you go next? Well, uh, before I graduated, I lived in Spain for a year. Okay. And uh, I was, I remember, I was in the library of the architecture school, and I opened this book, and it looked, I saw these buildings that looked like they were from Star Wars, but they were, they fit this land that looked a lot like Texas. And so, this idea of something looking like it was a thousand years old, but then in the future also, and it looked everything else looked like Texas, intrigued me. I realized that that was actually Spain, uh, and which I thought was awesome because I could speak Spanish, so you know, cool. And so I went over there for a year. I did not want to come back. Uh, I had to uh, <laughs> come back so I could graduate and, uh, and then ultimately get licensed, which I did not. But uh, please my parents, uh, but we negotiated, and in between was New York. Okay. Uh, so I moved to New York City partially because I wanted to get back to these global ideas and these uh, global ways of being, uh, but also because the economy was really bad at that time. And so there what year was this? This was right after 9-11. Uh, oh, and you moved to New York right after 9-11? Yeah, like 10 months after. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and so the tourism industry was bad, no one was, construction was dead, uh, and, uh, and my best friend and I thought, oh, let's just go to New York and beat out other kids for jobs uh, and, and work for places that have global clients, which was kind of crazy because that's what everybody else was thinking, so like there was actually more competition over there, but we didn't really... You were young and optimistic. Yeah. That's the we nice were, way to say that. Yeah, and we had a list of all of these other UT alum. So there were 40, and, I, and, I, and they had locations of where each one worked. So I literally went to every, in person, I went to every one of those offices and I dropped off my portfolio and I talked about myself, and I got two, no, three interviews and two job offers off of it, and it took six weeks. But it was high stress because I had gotten a small gift from my father, and my best friend had not gotten any money, so I shared mine with her, and together we got jobs. Okay, and what did you do? Architecture. No, I know, I mean, like... <laughs> <laughs> oh, like, uh, what was my job? Uh, so my first position was uh, to document a series of 18 buildings that used to be a textile factory off of the coast of Rhode Island. 
and I had to do this in December and January. So temperatures were 10 to 20 degrees, and I was trained out there to measure everything. It was a total of, it was over 300,000 square feet that I had to measure by hand, and my job was to measure the windows. <laughs> Every window. <laughs> Every window, because they were all different, because it was a textile factory from 18... Do you ever think they were trying to convince you maybe you should do this? So, like, uh, yeah. Or is that just how you were in your stripes in architecture? They haze you right out of the gate. So that's, yeah, they, you get so hazed right out of the gate in architecture. And it's kind of this, like, badge of honor where, like, oh, if you made it past that, then I'll for sure make it to the next step. I wouldn't have made it to window two. No. Measuring's <laughs> I mean, hard. Sometimes I, I, I wondered, like, my hands would be like this. But there, it was kind of weird because there was this... Uh, a shack, like a seafood shack next door, and the people who owned it were from Guatemala, and they would just make these stews for me that, oh my god, so that was kind of the benefit. And then the my company would uh, buy the executive class uh, train fare, and I thought that was like, ooh, I'm so business. Free coffee. Yeah, free coffee. <laughs> I can sleep here, so it was kind of silly. Okay, so you put some time in as an architect, and then you decided you need to change the direction. Yeah, well, so the economy tanked again, <laughs> and now we're talking 2008, and at that point, uh, uh, I was uh, front-facing in uh, the firms that I worked at, because I was the only female employee in the entire firm, and because uh, on many occasions the woman in the partnership makes the decision, and we did do luxury residential, and uh, a lot of real estate developers that we worked with depended on women's opinions to for a go no go because they knew that the woman would be the influencer in experiencing these spaces. Um, I had gotten a lot of exposure. I had this really cool job, uh, and uh, I was in the room when the discussions with real estate developers and the banks and all that kind of stuff would go down, and I couldn't understand anything. <laughs> And so I thought, I need to learn they, about... Did you cover finance as part of your architecture program in no, five years? No, so that was interesting. It, there, there was not. We had a legal uh, a class on like contracts. We basically learned about contractor and agent contracts, <coughs> three very simple contracts. And then we had, uh, I think that, there was another kind of real world class, but I can't. So two real world all. classes yeah, in of, five years. Yeah, well, yeah, and everything else was design and concept, yeah. Yeah, so, so forward 10 years, I thought, uh, wow, like I understand maybe 10% of what's going on, and yet when I leave this meeting, I have to do eight options for drawings that I can't, you know, relate to. So I applied to business school because I thought that a degree in finance would, or finance would be what I needed. So, Is there an official pronunciation? It's finance, but I like to say finance. I do that a lot. I do that with like all kinds of pronunciation, uh, with all words, all types of words. So it, it'll be silly. Don't, yeah. don't feel bad. Texans do that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. They just own it. Yeah, yeah. Well, Houston and Houston, uh, our office is here, and I say Houston a lot. Well, no, that's finance, different. Now like, oh. you're just being wrong. Yeah. I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so you go and and you like you get a you get a full MBA. I do. From, so, where? from Cornell. Sounds it's like a light program. <laughs> 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 so I think I'm a glutton for pain because Cornell is the practical school where they're going to run you through every spreadsheet, every pro. I mean, you are going to be on teams putting out recommendations that you would as if you were in McKinsey. But whereas Harvard kind of does this like lighter thing where it's like a theoretical conversation. At Cornell, you have to run all the numbers, which are subjective and may or not may not mean anything. But it's a lot of exercise. It's very exact subjectiveness. <laughs> yes, very exact subjectiveness. But I thought that if I went through the practical, it would be an education for me that would uh, give me. You know, it's kind of like learning well, learning math or numbers. Like if you know like the fundamental way an equation works, then after that you can kind of leave it and you'll you'll get the gist in conversations years and years later. So that was my theory, and it worked, it works. Uh, I'm not, I don't uh, run too many numbers anymore, but I get 90% of all conversations 
having to do with real estate development, so that's an improvement. That's pretty good. It's a very deal-heavy business. It is a very deal-heavy business. <laughs> okay. Okay, so you've, you now, you're super qualified for a bunch of different things. <laughs> yeah. Right, so you go and get a high-paying job somewhere. Uh, yeah, I get a zero-paying job. Oh, okay, other direction. Yeah, other direction. <laughs> So you know how I said that the economy tanked? Yes, uh, it again? Was, again, in 2008, yeah. By 2010, it was not up. Uh, so I graduated and it, uh, it was like the apocalypse in New York. All of the banks were gone, there were tumbleweeds, Mayor Bloomberg was trying to get Silicon Valley to come over. Uh, he was giving incentives to everybody in LA, asking them to like make movies, all of a sudden movies were on every block which is great, <clears throat> excuse me, and it turned out really well, but <clears throat> I was kind of behind on the trend because I had gone to school to get the finance degree to, you know, make the oh, deal. you missed the curve. I missed it. I missed it completely. So I decided to jump ship and get into startup land where I thought, okay, if I was this uh, late before I had a business degree, now I have one, and I know how to predict trends, and I did pretty well. I was in a, a, a hedge fund course in Cornell, and um, I uh, put a lot of time into my my bet, and I made the most money from the hedge fund that year, so I thought, okay, I can maybe look at trends and do something. So I did, and things went really well for a while. Okay, and so on, in the hedge fund, or in the, in the uh, in Well, the both in the hedge fund. The hedge fund kept making money, even though I wasn't there. Okay. But uh, uh, but also for myself. So uh, being involved in uh, the startup community was also a very uh, uh, educational moment and a very exciting moment because now everything that happened like really meant something because it was very do or die. And so I I liked that and it was it was fun. Um, I tried many different smaller things should I what so, what so okay so let's talk about what currency <clears throat> currency so currency Wait, first how is currency spelled <laughs> so currency is c u r r e n t s y uh, so currency um, it was kind of a silly thing uh, we were trading uh, 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 well we were trading commodities, hard goods, but we were doing it in the fashion industry. So what it was is designers in contemporary fashion and buyers in contemporary fashion could come to our digital trade platform and get kind of a business uh, uh, dashboard that would uh, have analytics embedded that would help, uh, help them know what was trending and what had a higher value, but also down to the quality of the materials and the value of the, you know, silks and those kinds of things. Um, so you, you turned fashion into a marketplace. I did. I turned fashion into a marketplace, but so, so did four other startups. That's <laughs> kind of how startups work a lot of times. <laughs> yeah, and that's, what, that's how things got interesting. And okay. So none of us made it through other than the one startup that pivoted and went and did hers in India. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so how far did you get that? Did you raise money? We did. We were very close to a, well, we raised seed, so that was, that was good. We developed the platform. Uh, we had clients. In fact, our seed investor owned, uh, uh, or our first investor owned a fashion house in Dallas, Texas. Um, so he very much knew the problem between uh, putting your uh, product up for market and not being able to afford the infrastructure that required it. And um, uh, so through him, we had uh, a community of a few thousand designers and of tens of buyers. And then he was also getting his one of his uh, colleagues who had the LA regional market on board. And so our startup was the one and that, that sounds like traction. Yeah, our startup was the one that had the most potential, but it was still it still didn't make it. We were in the lead. And we still did not make it. Okay, so what what happened? What what ended you? Well, you know, so sometimes good players have more control over you than you think, even though you don't know them and you believe they're like ten degrees removed. Uh, what happened was that the 
Las Vegas trade show owner started going on an acquisition spree. And so they bought out the New York City trade show. Oh, hold on. So there was like a trade show where this was normally done manually, like people would show up and literally trade? Yeah, yeah we were killed by the manual people. So the digital <laughs> girls got killed by the manual people. And where the manual people promised their communities that they were going to build an app. So don't worry, don't invest in competitors because if you invest in competitors, you might lose your spot on the conference floor. And so that, you know, a, everyone who was in the seed community, or all four of us, just kind of fell off the face of the earth. And it being that big of a departure, we feel like they felt like they would lose their spot yeah. otherwise. Okay, so so you ended up not you didn't get the next round of funding. You ended up having to close it down, and that had to be right. hard. That was super hard. I mean, that was like the end of the world because again, we were in the lead. We had two regional markets on board. Uh, we had some uh, big names on the seed list, and and so here I was, you, you know, with the martini at the bar, thinking I was hot stuff, and then the next day it was nothing, and and I had no money. So I had to rethink what was going to happen. Okay. And I did that here in San Antonio. Okay, so you, you decided to leave New York. I did. Slightly less expensive than San Antonio. A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, and so uh, why San Antonio? Well, my sister lives here. Okay. And uh, I was very close, I am very close with her, and my parents had just retired here. So I thought, why not you know, start again near my family? because um, it would, I could depend on them for a few things and life would be a little easier, so I did. Okay, and you came here with a, were you thinking, I'll come and regroup and go back and attack New York one more time? I did, so that's the thing about people who like the grind <laughs> that I'm learning. It's like you feel like you know, you'll never surrender. <laughs> And so, uh, yeah, that was the plan. I was going to go back to New York. I was just going to kind of chill for three months. Um, I was also looking into opportunities in Dallas. Um, uh, and then um, my brother-in-law got ahead of it. I, you know, I think the family kind of colluded, and they're like, let's get her a job here. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, they, uh, they, they, an offer came, and, and then uh, my brother-in-law also kind of pushed me into social circles, so I had made a few friends, um, and so I thought, okay, you know, it's going to be a temporary, you know, I'm just going to, like, do some consulting, and I'll be on my way to New York, and that's, like, three years later, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what's your, what's the first job that you settled in here? Well, it was real estate development, and it was for uh, Red McCombs. Okay. Uh, yeah, and it was... That's when I realized it was very uh, like a volatile, volatile market for real estate development here. It's very kind of wild west. You kill what you, what you eat, and I really like that. I do like that, but um, uh, I didn't have enough experience in it. I think I was still a little kind of in the glass box of architecture and design and loving kind of like theoretical things and not so much being exposed to deal making. So that was kind of it. I was going to say, how much of the deal is different? I mean, the scale of the deal has to be different between here and New York. It is. And that was another thing that was uh, uh, life-changing. Because over there, um, I had been offered a few jobs uh, after I had graduated. And so, like, some of them was, uh, one of them was, uh, you know, your, your uh, charm, you know, your social, how about, you become a real estate broker and you can work with uh, asset A, uh, cl uh, uh, class A assets. Uh, and in New York, that means I would work with buildings that were at least $20 million in value or higher. And, uh, Is that most of the buildings in New York? Yeah, it was a big, you know, it was, yeah. <laughs> it, yeah, uh, it, it didn't take much to, to get that, so the market was good for that. But I thought, well, you know, I have a background in architecture. I think I want to do value add deals where you take something that's distressed and then you kind of you rework it, you position it, and you bring it to life. So I don't know if I want to be a broker. And then uh, when I when I came here, the deals were very different. It was like maybe if it was three million, it would be great. And then the, everything was value add. 
And so that was something that, and not in a bad way, in a good way, like everything could be improved. I think we all know that, um, uh, you know, there are some existing buildings here that could be repositioned. And well, I mean, think about the building we're sitting in right now, right? Right. Like this, how, long was, how long did this thing sit bothballed? I don't know. Unloved. A long time. I mean, yeah. the downstairs, isn't that a wonderful retail space? And I mean, it, it's, it's coming along, but it's been a decade. Yeah. Um, so that's what driving around here thinking, oh, maybe in a few months. I just kept seeing all this potential everywhere. And, and you like improving things. I love improving things. I love making things better. Okay, so you, you, but then you took a little break from, uh, from real estate deals to do another, another startup. I did because <laughs> another, okay, so another thing that I like that I think makes me an entrepreneur is I like to move quickly. And I like to work fast. And so in architecture, the average deal or the average project takes six years to complete. And in real estate, it could be more than that. It could be 15. Uh, so for me, I'm, you know, it's like snail pace. And, and I just get, I want to move faster. The way I did that in architecture was I worked for retail clients or hotel clients that were moving quickly across the globe. Uh, but here in San Antonio, it, a lot, everything was a local market, so um, I had to adhere to that pace. Uh, so I tried, uh, I did another trading uh, effort uh, 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 with uh, doing this kind of play on Amazon, but it didn't work out. And then I also started getting into uh, uh, the wearables, and I started researching that. I okay, even, so, so what year was that? That was 2013. Did they call them wearables then? I don't know. Because now we call them wearables because there's more than one. Yeah, what was it? Was there a Fitbit? Yeah, it was a. I, so that was like it, right? Yeah, and I forgot what I called it. That was Anybody it. buy a Fitbit it was in 2013? Fitbit. Anybody got a Fitbit now? Yeah, okay. Yeah. It's a hard space. It's <laughs> difficult. And, and yeah, and so I thought. Oh, I bet Tori Birch is going to come out with something because she's kind of this like innovative thing, and I bet she's. That's gonna, a fashion thing, right? Mm -hmm, it's okay. a fashion thing. And, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Tori Birch is is a person who, in fashion, uh, grew her company at the pace that Google would have, and I had followed her from the beginning because uh, uh, she was also in like the New York City gossip. Pages, so I knew her when she was the wife of a hedge fund person. I didn't know her. I don't know her. But I would <laughs> you read, read about, about her. her. You were familiar with who she was. Yes. And then all of a sudden she's in fashion. Then all of a sudden she's worth a billion dollars. And so I thought, wow, that's that's awesome. Let's do that. Let's do that. <laughs> and I also learned that she would bring in Google uh, executives to her company to teach them how to scale. Uh, so that was kind of the integration, like fashion and technology can integrate, it can work. Um, so I guess I attribute that to her, but I also wanted to compete with her. And I thought, okay, I bet Tori Birch is going to get into this market because everyone in her segment wants to uh, be healthy. And so, but would Tori Birch do another plastic thing? No, she would probably do a metal thing. And how much would she price it? I did all kinds of research on that. And so I decided she would do some sort of metal thing that would not uh, compromise the, the, the bit inside. I could not get a maculador to give me the price that I wanted. So I thought, okay, if I cannot make a play on this like price point, which is the only way I felt like you know I couldn't really bring innovation or anything, it would just be a simple in out, make some money, uh, then I'm not going to get in. Later, two years later, Tori Birch comes out with her thing, and she priced it twice what I thought she was going to do, and so I could have made money. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and also here, there's a startup here in San Antonio that solved the antenna problem. Yeah, uh, which was which is awesome. Wiseware, yeah. yeah, right. right. I love them. So you were so close. So close. <laughs> but anyway, so yeah, that was my uh, journey into tech, and then back into the startup community because I asked uh, everyone in Geekdom about it, and uh, I uh, met a lot of people on that basis. Okay. Do you have any early mentors that were important? Yeah, Michael Girdley. He, I really liked him. He was very sharp. He spoke quickly. He like gave it to me like it was. He, you know, would say yes, no, or that's horrible, or you're dumb, and or he'd be like, oh, that can make money, and 
And then he started saying, oh, you should take debt. Don't take equity from anyone because this is going to make money. Just try to find a way to take debt. And apparently, you know, ultimately that's kind of the, uh, a compliment, right? <laughs> so, yeah, him and Alan Weingratz and, uh, or Wein I, I'm maybe not pronouncing it right, like, is, um, and then also Nick Longo. Nick Longo was uh, the one who put together the network, and so uh, through him, um, I reached out to Peter, and then Peter and I reached out to Brett, and that's how Rising Barn kind of became well, I mean, something. I was gonna say you're, you're jumping ahead. Oh, am I? Okay. Well, so like, okay, you finished the wearables. Yes. It doesn't work out again. Yeah, it doesn't work out. But at least, so it's, not any, at least it's not an economic downturn yeah. this time. But let me tell you about something that did, yeah, let me tell you about something that did work out that okay. I did not mention. For currency, I made a little app. It was a sample sale app because, uh, and what sample sales in New York are, and I didn't make it, I, ha I hired somebody to make it. A friend and I hired some, some contracted, <laughs> but uh, a native iOS developer to make one. Um, and we also contracted a graphic designer, but we knew that designers were always on the fourth or fifth floor and they had this like uh, merchandise that were samples that they would mail to buyers uh, in stores across the country to see if the buyers wanted to carry their line in the store. But then they would get them returned and they would have all this amazing uh, stuff that they couldn't sell. So we, on push notification and this like GPS thing that Google came out with, um, we had it so that if you downloaded the app and you were walking by a designer's a studio that was hosting a sample sale at that time, you would get a notification, you could go upstairs and you could earn some money. So we did sell that for a little, a small amount, and um, I think uh, People Magazine acquired. Okay. Yeah. So that was the one little success, but it wasn't very much. We put way more sweat than dollars came back. So. Yeah, well, you have an exit. That's a victory in some circles. Yeah. Okay, so you wearables, you can't figure out how to make it right. You get to Girdley. You also work, start working in architecture again. You miss the, the building side of it. Yes. So, uh, the core of San Antonio is gorgeous. Um, and so driving around, I'm always inspired by what's here. And San Antonio was my favorite city in Texas, um, looking at it plan-wise. So when I was in architecture school, I just thought, wow, like this like Roman thing of coming to the circle and there's this river in the middle, like it's just got to be. I mean, are you attracted to the fact that it's 300 years old? That too. You know, it's also a 300 year old city and it's got, it's really rich. <clears throat> and so being here, I would, in my mind, I would be set back to that. So that, and, you know, falling in love again with architecture, I thought, okay, well, let me get back to those roots. And fortunately, there was a, an architect here who uh, um, knew about my background. And so I consulted for him for a while, and, uh, and, and that was great. And that kind of spurred me into getting back into the, the core of what I liked about architecture. Okay, so with him, you're working on big, complicated, long projects. Oh yeah, again, yeah. <laughs> so for him, it was like six to eight years, and maybe they'll pan out, and maybe they won't, and there's two or three projects in the office, and five people are every day, you know, drawing and drawing, and it just gets changed, and uh, years go by, and you know, maybe you jump from SD to DD, um, well, and, what does SD to DVD mean? It's uh, not a uh, disc thing. Yeah, no, no, no. There are like four phases to a, a design project. And so the first two are schematic design and design development. Uh, so that's kind of the, turn, the big one where if you get into design development, you're more likely to get into construction development. But you have to get out of the schematic phase or, you know, the, or the project's not going to get done. Um, so uh, it was, you know, the schematic phase is tense, but it's also when your client can put you on hold for six months and then, you know, maybe come back if they felt like it. Uh, so there's a lot how of many, that. How many projects does an architect draw that never go anywhere? Well, <laughs> um, I would say that an average office of 10 to 15 which is the average. A lot of there is about five, a handful of offices here that have more than 50 employees, which is great. It's spectacular, actually. Um, but the average office is 10 to 15, and usually the dis the design executive offices are very small. Um, so 
they would do, I don't know, 15 to 20 schematic designs and maybe two to three would go into DD and then from there one would go into construction. Maybe two into construction. Wow. But yeah. Um, I mean, I worked on projects in Dubai where it was like the third wife uh, wanted to create a museum with, you know, uh, seven levels of security and there was like one private entry for the, you know, Prime Minister of UK and we're like, really? Is this really going to go through? No. But we'd get paid to draw it up and everyone would accept it because then you could say you did something like that. Which, I don't know, is that business savvy? That's a good question okay. for another time. I was going to say, so it ended up being dissatisfying because you were more patient than that. I am. So it's dissatisfying for me. It's great for someone who just loves to live in the schematic design phase. Okay. So you. You strip back down and try to do something by yourself, mm -hmm. right? And so, what 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 is this new idea you have to break out? Right. Well, so uh, so kind of like the Bon Jovi Club, <laughs> I thought, wouldn't it be easy if you could? No, please, wait, I don't want to like have the Bon Jovi Club. Like, be your tagline. Yeah, yeah. I'm never uh, forgetting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but wouldn't it be great if you could put up structures of panel at a time? Um, and you do that in the commercial industry. There, every, a lot of stuff is standardized so that you're not putting together sticks. Where, but in the residential market, everything is, is, gets cut on site and it gets caught by someone uh, local who may or may not be reading the drawings. And so sometimes it gets done, well, most times it gets done fairly well, but there's, you know, a lot of that impacts the life cycle of a home. And if you all know, most homes in San Antonio start requiring a lot of maintenance after year 10. And it starts hitting in like year five. And you, you can build a home quickly and have it last 40 years if you kind of plan a way to not be so dependent on that final guy at the end of the line. And so that's what I started working, you know, reverse engineering. Like how can we get all of that planning at the beginning so that the guy at the end of the line is kind of just having fun putting stuff together and not having to figure everything out when the sun is like hitting part on his back and all he wants to do is just get out of there. Okay, and so what's this thing called? Well, uh, <laughs> well, it's a, I think, it, it's patent pending right now. I haven't read the title of it in a while, but I think it's like System for Panelized Something Modular Small Building Dwellings. No, like, but you did it inside a company. <laughs> What's oh. the company called? Oh, the company. Okay, so the nobody, company. Nobody tried to steal her patent. <laughs> <laughs> She's very sensitive about her one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You don't remember the name of I don't remember either. the name of. Lots of uh, like, official sounding words. Uh, but it's a Rising Barn, so that's the latest. Okay, so what? what so you, you, it, it's a, all these things evolved, right? So what was V1 of Rising Barn? V1 of Rising Barn was literally barns. Um, Good <laughs> I, name. Yeah, <laughs> it fits then. You know, it fit then. Literally barns. I, there was a need for uh, uh, large landowners to create structures that would shade and house their, their valuables. And in modern times, those valuables are usually boats or big trucks or, you know, not always horses. Uh, the margin on that market is 70%. And uh, it's very difficult to get a project like that going because the labor market in South Texas was over drilling shale at the time. So I thought, okay, well if I can design a system where these barns would get built much faster, then it, I could participate in that 70% margin and get something going. Uh, and, and I did, but um, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, I applied to an, a business accelerator uh, because I believe that this panel system was high, was tech, you know, it was, it was design technology, and so therefore uh, Rising Barn merited being a part of these like tech incubators, and uh, fortunately when I applied there were two guys on the panel and they were like, oh my god, if you would have applied a year ago I would have bought from you because I just spent two years on my ranch like suffering through this and every time I'd mess something up it was another three months of me trying to fix it, so I made it through, I got in there. And uh, it was Texas Venture Labs, and they assigned you a group of graduate students who did intense market research. Uh, their results on their studies was that there was a much 
larger need on small scale homes. And by that point, I had kept working on this idea of panelized construction that I now had it to where I could inhabit a, a human in the dwelling, right? Not just an object. So you're making sounds so technical. <laughs> Humans can inhabit it. Humans can inhabit it. <laughs> it's Instead like of boats, not just yeah, boats anymore. It's like this ship that landed. <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, yeah, humans can inhabit it. Uh, but anyway, so I was like, okay, we can do that. What would, what, what, how big is this market in the small infill thing? And it was enormous. And so, uh, I, you know, I, I, I put some feelers out there. I did some Craigslist postings, and I, you know, did some social media. And wow, I started getting all of these calls from people in central neighborhoods or gentrifiers who just wanted a smaller simple home in an inner city lot that they thought was super cool because it would be really close to the downtown spot that they wanted to be in uh, but they couldn't get anyone to build for them out there so um, so then so people don't want to build in remote locations because it's a pain to get out there People who don't want to build in infill places either, even though it's like, I mean, isn't it easy to get into the city? Like, why don't people want to build inside the city? Well, because it takes big machines to build things, and it takes a lot of people. So that's a condensed space. And so bringing all your trucks in and then having all the people oh, so when your, your truck is bigger than the house, you have a problem. Kind of. <laughs> so, so yeah. Uh, so it's, it's difficult in both situations, which is why there's a lot of suburban construction. Uh, happening because that's where it's easy. Okay. Uh, but at the same time, it's not that easy. So what builders must do is they need to make sure that they get their product or their home to a, a price point that will allow them to profit. I mean, in a, on a good day, nine percent, but most times four percent. And I even think that's kind of optimistic, but uh, uh, but. Uh, but if the conditions need to be right. And in order for them to get those numbers back, they have to justify it, and that's why a lot of the homes today are very big, because uh, they feel that since you know it doesn't cost that much more to make an extra room, they can use that extra room to leverage the price point up, and then they make their return. But the thing is that that trend is... Right, so so okay. the builder, like, it's not just that people like big homes. It's that the builders have an incentive to make big homes. Yeah. And then people go, well, who wouldn't like more room? Right. And then and then it's like, oh, there's three rooms over there making, you know, collecting cobwebs because I really only need these rooms. Uh, but the house looks really nice and big, and I look great, and uh, and that and that's fine. But and I don't think it's it's something that I don't. The builders have an incentive to do that, but that's what they need in order to make it at the end of the day. Right? That's how they justify it. Uh, and that's because there aren't very many people at the front end or at the beginning of the cycle trying to not and trying to avoid these constraints for people at the end of the cycle. So if you kind of just like fix all of those variables that makes everything expensive and kills your profit margin from the beginning, you'll be able to build you know whatever is in the best interest of the customer um, as well. Okay. So okay, so so where's Rising Barn today? So we're at the beginning of the cycle, and we are a two-part company where we develop the technology that helps fix these problems up front. But because we're makers and we want to make sure that our stuff gets on the ground, we are also real estate developers, and so we make deals and and we put homes uh, on the ground. And and I mean, do you have a? Is there a part of that that you're more excited about personally than the other? Well, I am a designer, <laughs> so I, I love the idea of uh, creating technology that will make the life of a designer much easier, uh, because if we're able to remove ourselves from the laborious tasks of having to draft these like 200 page documents that the guy at the end of the line is not going to read anyway, then that frees up our time to be able to make many more of these. Um, and if we can make more uh, homes that uh, take less time to build, uh, then that just helps the next person along. They, they can make more, and then, and then there's more for everybody, and people aren't competing for, for the same home that's at a price that's too expensive. So 
uh, it takes software to make that happen. And uh, for the past two years, I worked on the hardware part, creating these panels that you can assemble, that you can assemble much more easily. And so now we're moving into creating the software that will work in advance of it. Uh, we've already done two uh, 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 automation prototypes that I think have a lot of potential. Uh, and I, we probably got 30 more to go, but uh, in the end, it'll be the system that can self-generate a, uh, a, a home that is exact uh, in its digital sense, so that we can take any pinpoint we know what the conditions are exactly. But from a designer's perspective, it has embedded uh, a style and a thoughtfulness uh, and, a, and a, a standard for quality that uh, you can, if the designer doesn't have to rethink a million times. So uh, sometimes I say, think of it as kind of like TurboTax for home design, where you kind of you put in what your requirements are. And because the software understands uh, the world of the environment and code regulation, it will then spit out an option. There will always be a need for the designer to go in and make sure everything's fine. But the thing is that you, the, in the end, the designer's not going to look for mistakes. The designer's going to look for ways to make it a nicer place to be for the end user. So what, are, what do you think have been your big struggles or obstacles? The construction industry is not, I mean, the hammers are nicer, but they function the, the exact same as they did 100 years ago. The, so the, con, the construction companies? I mean, Can you ask me that again? Well, so like, what, I mean, it doesn't seem like they have uh, welcomed innovation. Right. Well, so yeah, there's, there's not. So, the, so, but there's a reason why. If you present innovation to a construction company and you say, look, here's a beautiful piece, and why don't you experiment with it, and why don't you test it, and, and, and so you're basically putting that job on the construction company to figure out what to do with this one piece. <coughs> so I think the way to go about it is to present a holistic solution and say, it's not a piece, it's a, it's a kit. It's a, it's, a, it's a whole thing where it in of itself kind of fits in nicely and so you don't have to think about it very much and your life would, would be much easier. I think that's how uh, uh, construction companies will embrace innovation. And, and so what, do you, what have been your kind of biggest obstacles in, in trying to get this vision moving forward? Uh, well, I... <laughs> it's, I, startups, there's always a long list. We, we need money? <laughs> That's like always the thing, right? That's always the thing. So we booked uh, 5.4 million in sales. It's about 60, 65 units. Uh, 50 of them is one project. Uh, that's great, but again, we're now exposed to this like six year life cycle, right? Where things go slow. So even though this is going to happen, it's like when is the payment gonna come in? So there's this, the team is trying to come up with a cash management plan on how, you know, should we go equity, should we go debt, and, you know, but if we get all these deals, we're not gonna need to sell any equity. Well, you know, how fast will all of these deals out. Nobody knows. Everyone loves the idea of it happening quickly, uh, but then, you know, but there are many other players in the happening of it that we can't control. So that's the, that's where we're at right now. We want to go fast, but this is super new that we have to do a lot of teaching and, and, uh, and introducing and meeting and talking before people start trusting it and saying, yeah, sure, I'll stamp that. Well, and fast in real estate terms can, is, is not necessarily fast, fast. Right. So whereas most projects are six years, we're hoping that we can start rolling out in two years. But for startup world, like you want to be out in two months. So we're kind of the slowest moving startup in San Antonio, but, <laughs> uh, but we're also getting a lot of traction, but people are going to just have to wait a while to see it, but not as long as in other occasions. So it's that, like, oh, what, two years? But it could be six. You know, we're doing it in two. Yeah. <laughs>
Okay, so so there's a bunch of people out here I know who are starting stuff or trying to start stuff or like you've survived a bunch of hey look you started it it got somewhere and then it didn't make it or you left and now you're doing that. Do you have any advice for how you stay in the game and you keep fighting the fight? Oh, uh, it's negotiation. Like you're negotiating with everyone. Sometimes you're even negotiating with your car. <laughs> like, Jeez, don't break down today. Uh, but. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it, um, there will always be someone who will help you get to the next day. Okay. So, this is probably a good time, is, is there any other advice you wanted to give? No, I think that's it. Okay, so the, there's, there's a little bit time left, it looks like, to do some question and, like, question and answers. So if you guys have questions, she's super friendly. <laughs> mm -hmm. Do you have an example home in the open ready that we can visit? Or we can look at? <laughs> there is a, a small one in Austin. It's okay. in the backyard of a wonderful client who took a huge risk because I contracted that client off of Craigslist. <laughs> um, there are How many homes are sold via Craigslist? I, I wonder about that. I, one. I, 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 one. Yeah. So far we know one. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, Craigslist has worked out well for me. Uh, uh, so there, there is a backyard studio in Austin. Um, after that, we had, and it was built uh, May of 2014. After that, we had about 12 clients who wanted to contract us, but they all, 11 of them needed mortgages. Um, and this was the beginning of huge problems for Peggy and Rising Barn, was that I could not get, uh, uh, I didn't have collateral, so I couldn't, I couldn't qualify as a builder. Uh, for these uh, clients, which made me think, okay, there is a demand, I just need to make my team stronger. And so I stopped things for a little while and worked on building the team. But you have, you have a project in Dignity oh, process, yeah. right? Yeah, we have a project in Dignity, three of them, uh, in three units, and uh, they are 30% complete. We've got about maybe 10 weeks of work on them and that includes the rain. I was like, minus rain. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Which, don't be mad at the rain, okay? We could use it. <laughs> I know, I know. It's <laughs> and then we have also uh, have a smaller backyard unit that we'll use as a demo. Um, and so that one is in construction, but it's in the purchasing phase. So okay. we're buying materials for it right now. And we've got 50 units in a schematic design. <laughs> need to get past uh, uh, and uh, that one uh, everyone's wanting to do a, a spring 2017 launch and it'll be a micro hotel All right. are these is the plan uh, to kind of go like kind of one-offs like lot by lot or would there maybe be like a kind of a quote-unquote development whatever like so 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 we, we did want to do one-offs, but uh, there are a lot of barriers in planning for a single lot because there's only so many of us on the team. Um, so uh, what we're doing instead is we are we're going to front load the software development so that we do have the capacity to be able to do one-off uh, one-off developments, but. Uh, that probably won't start happening for another year, uh, which means that in the meantime, we need to get some kind of big wins so that we, the business stays alive, and that's why we took on the 50-unit hotel, and we're seeking, uh, we're looking at uh, 15 units near UTSA, and then uh, 300 units in Northeast San Antonio, uh, doing it that way. Uh, it's also very good for our software development team to kind of have fun clusters, because then they can test uh, their software against these homes that are all kind of in similar scenarios, and so uh, it'll help us get stronger faster. How did you go about building your team? Uh, <laughs> I talked myself up a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I really did, and sometimes some of the things that would come out of my mouth, I would say, oh, oh. at this <laughs> and I had it was something I hadn't done in seven years and I would say yes <laughs> uh, but uh, because I will be 
and I will make sure I am three days before the meeting. <laughs> uh, so it was, it was a lot of that. Um, a lot of, um, I, I think, just um, having confidence and, and, and making sure that you're able to uh, commun communicate uh, or, or I feel like everything's kind of a negotiation because, and, and I call it negotiation, but it's a balance, right? So make sure you can read uh, the person that you're interested in, their strengths and their weaknesses, and that you can offset that and, and show that there can be a happy balance between the two of you and that together you're stronger. Um, and so that was always my approach. And even though I was petitioning myself to them, uh, it was, I was also making sure that I believed that we would be a good partnership. All the way back. What was your biggest misperception as to who your customer really is? Oh, uh, <laughs> uh, my customer right now is not the individual because there is a lot to solve for, and a lot of that is in the financial industry. Uh, so what, 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 uh, that's the one, that we want to serve the uh, person that makes 100% of the median income in San Antonio, but right now we need to kind of go around that indirectly because we ultimately couldn't. I couldn't, I couldn't get certified as a business to, to uh, uh, provide them my service. The risk and reward in it was way too high that no one thought I could get a profit from. And so because that was incredible, I, we needed to back off and do it from a real estate development perspective and take on bundles because then it was easy to, easier to uh, be able to service that group. So we did kind of go back to like traditional ways uh, but we uh, uh, have a, a team dedicated to unlocking the, the issues that keep people in the median segment from being able to purchase. And that is trying to get vacant land in East San Antonio to not have so many restrictions on it, trying to get those taxes off of it, wiped off, so that those lots become affordable. Um, but yeah. Uh, the, the people we want to serve are the people we can't serve right now. Yes? Are you saying like the construction industry is uh, having a hard time to innovate and change with you guys? Is that more of the perspective of maybe, um, is it like more of construction uh, companies or is it like engineer companies not wanting to, like the P, P on the stamp on It's both. It's both. So com a convincing an engineering company to take on a, a completely new uh, uh, sy yeah, system, uh, th there's research involved. And so uh, there's a learning curve, and that affects their overhead. And uh, they don't want to devote the time to do that because it means they lose money. Uh, so however, we have found a, a few engineering companies that have that uh, vision and the passion to uh, put some effort and, and time into understanding new methods that would uh, end up being more profitable for them in the long run. Uh, good thing though that IECC code, which is the kind of the environmental codes that a lot of cities adhere to, they're also leaning towards uh, uh, monolithic systems for uh, uh, for building uh, and composite panels, things like that. Uh, and mainly it's because uh, the tighter your envelope is, the more energy savings you have, and so the less cost and the better for all kinds of things. And so the laws are on our side. Um, it just depends on how fast they're going to get there. So in following up on that IGCC thing, have you had any interaction with the city and like their like code enforcement of construction and whatnot, has that been smooth? And then how about the fabrication of your materials? Is that, where is that? Yeah, so uh, so for a project in, in Dignity, Dignity, <laughs> or Dignity, 
Um, there were many meetings at the city, and every time we would have a meeting, there would be three or four people sitting at the table, all wanting to learn. And uh, so that was interesting. I didn't think that our little project was going to get that much attention, but it did. Um, now, um, I, there are key people in the city that know our system because we provided all the documentation for them to learn, and so we think that every new project will be easier. Uh, what was the second? The fabrication of the materials for the kids. So, uh, we uh, were producing in Kerrville, but our team is working on uh, getting players in, at that factory relocate themselves to San Antonio. Uh, and it will uh, be some sort of partnership with Rising Barn where uh, we can have direct access to their processes. And then that way the software that we developed will be integrated into the way they work and it is a closed loop. Cool. So, last question. Um, there's other companies who do similar projects, correct, in the U.S.? Yes. What makes you different and why, I guess my perception is that they're succeeding. I mean, what is all the variables? Um, well, so um, there are a few companies. Uh, Blue Homes is the one that maybe gets the most exposure. They focus on foldable technology that is based on steel. Um, and that's very expensive stuff. So their price point is $350 a square foot to $700 a square foot. We come in at 100 to 150. So and and that's that's uh, a, you know that that is very core to our business model. We want our homes to be for everyone. Um, so uh, so that's one. Their homes are not for everyone. They're for a small amount of people. Uh, then there are others uh, where it's very much about affordable housing, uh, but I think their goal is to just get uh, people who need homes <coughs> uh, under a roof for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, so in my opinion, they're not long-lasting, durable homes. They're kind of just a, a safe place for people, which is a wonderful thing to do, don't get me wrong, but uh, I'm, I'm very tech-oriented, so I kind of want something to last 50 years and be a very good quality. And while right now we can get it into the 100 to 150 dollars square foot, the better we get, we've uh, estimated that we can go down to 70 in three years, which will help us hit. It's for the finish home or the square foot of the panel? <coughs> the the finish home. Do you have any parting thoughts for that? Advice or well, uh, well, I do have parting thoughts. Thank you for coming. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this was awesome. Thank you.